Okay, so Nature Method has every year a, uh, he announces a method that is the method of the year that could transform the biology and the way we do it. And what I want to try to do today is to uh, give some examples of these basic research associated methodologies that we think in the future we can take them to um, clinical understanding of disease and treatments. So the major problem I will touch about today is heart failure. And you all know that the adult heart has very limited regenerative capacity. And therefore, any significant damage to heart cells, such as it cures, for example, during myocardial infarction, is irreversible. And the uh, necrotic muscle is replaced by a scar tissue. And if a patient develops heart failure, um, its prognosis may be worse than cancer that Professor Bia described. We know that 50% of heart failure patients will die within five years, and we know that it's a huge impact on, on the healthcare system with, just as an example, it is responsible for more hospitalizations than all forms of cancer combined. For the end-stage heart failure, the only solution is, of course, uh, cardiac transplantation, and as you can see in this cartoon, there are more people waiting for the organ than we actually to have them. So in order to try to find alternative treatment for these heart failure patients and patients with heart failure with less advanced form, people have thought of perhaps replacing the missing heart cells with new heart cells. The question is where we can get these new heart cells. And in 1999, we, fa we found the possibility to get these heart cells. So work of Professor Itzkovich, who is the head of our OBG department, in collaboration with Jamie Thompson and University of Wisconsin, resulted in the generation of the first human embryonic stem cells. These cells that were derived from the early embryo can be propagated indefinitely in the dish, in the undifferentiated embryonic state. When removed from these conditions, they can be coaxed to differentiate to a variety of cell types. So in 2001, we were very fortunate to describe the first cardiomyocyte differentiation of these human embryonic stem cells into beating heart cells. And we were really excited to see these beating heart cells in the dish. This was the first time that anybody generated human heart tissue. And these cells beat forever. I've been showing this slide for 15 years, and they still beat in the slide. <laughs> but the, the longest we've held them in the dish is, is for more than a year. So if you want to use these cells to um, regenerate the heart, it's not enough to have heart cells with heart cell properties. You would want to transplant the cells, and you want these cells to integrate appropriately with the heart. Because if these cells will beat at one time and the heart will beat at a different timing, it won't help. It can be even result in deterioration in heart function. So integration, appropriate integration is a very important issue. So to answer this question, we started with a study in a dish in which we took the human heart cells, put them next to rat heart cells, and within a few hours, I hope you can appreciate that the two cell types started to beat in synchrony. And we did this study on an array of electrodes recording electrical activity, and we demonstrated that indeed this coupling was true electrical coupling with every electrical activity identified in the human cells, also we see appropriate electrical activity in the rat cells. So this taught us that, first of all, we are not that different from rats, okay? So we can uh, integrate our cells with rat cells. And the next question is, could this happen also in the human heart or in the in vivo heart? So we did several studies. This is one example in which we demonstrated that, indeed, the cells can also integrate after transplantation into the in vivo heart. We then wanted to have a proof of concept study to see if we can actually improve the function of uh, diseased hearts. So to this end, we created a myocardial infarction model of in rats. We didn't feed the rats years of McDonald's and waited that they develop atherosclerosis and had a spontaneous infarction, but rather we um, by surgery occluded, tied the left anterior descending artery. This resulted in creation of myocardial infarction. A week later, we came in back and implanted our cells into the infarcted area. If you follow the function of these rats, you can see that a normal rat starts here. When creating infarcts, its function deteriorates the fractional shortening to about 20%. If you don't do anything, we can see typical abnormal remodeling like we see in patients that have undergone a myocardial infarction with continuous deterioration of function. 
If we transplant cells that are not cardiomyocytes, we still see this abnormal remodeling. But if we transplant our human cells, we can see that this abnormal remodeling is prevented and there's even some improvement. And in histology, we could identify the cells within the heart. So this was encouraging. Nevertheless, we saw also some shortcomings. We couldn't get the heart function back to its original state. And uh, most of the cells, more than 90%, were eventually lost. And the ones that did survive did not form a very mature graft. So uh, we need a lot of work in this area. So what are, the, what are the problems? How can we get to eventually clinical treating patients with human heart cells? And to this end, we teamed with the University Health Network at Canada to start a project to get into first in men clinical trials within five years. The first question is numbers of cells. In the rat, it was enough to uh, inject two million or three million heart cells to show improvement. But the human heart has four billion cells and a heart attack that results in heart failure, we lose a quarter. And many of the cells that we transplant are lost, so you can appreciate that we need to uh, transplant more than a billion cells per patient. So over the years since our initial uh, protocols, many labs, including my collaborator at Toronto, Gordon Keller, has tried to learn from embryology how does the heart form. What cues make the cells become a heart cells and not a liver cells? And by using this information, we can now generate protocols in which all the stem cells are differentiated into heart cells, more than 90%. You can see that the entire cells that are differentiating are beating, and you can stain them, you see that more than 90% are heart cells. So combining this with bioreactor technology, we can now make billions of heart cells with an affordable cost that can be used uh, to treat patients. So getting enough cells is not an issue anymore. The second problem is the immune rejection. Since we are not transplanting the patient's own cell, these cells are expected to be rejected, although they are probably much less immunogenic than uh, uh, an entire organ. So one, the first generation would probably involve giving some kind of mild immune suppression to the patient to prevent rejection, like we do to organ transplant. But the next generation may benefit from the second technology that I want to describe. Uh, I would like you to meet Shinya Yamanaka, you can see him here. What Shinya did in 2006, work for which he received the Nobel Prize in 2012, this was the shortest time between discovery and Nobel Prize, okay? So what Yamanaka did was to take adult somatic cells, such as skin cells, and by introducing a set of uh, genes that are affected in embryonic cells, he was re able to reprogram an adult cell back to a state resembling the earliest cells in the embryo, resembling embryonic stem cells. He called these cells induced pluripotent stem cells. So you can imagine you take a, a skin cell from a patient who is 90 years old, you take it through a time tunnel back to a state resembling a, a state when it was a fertilized egg, okay? So now you can take these induced pluripotent stem cells, make from them liver cells, heart cells, and so on, and if you transplant them to the same patient, these cells will not be rejected. And this really turned to be a robust technology. So now we routinely take um, skin fibroblast or blood cells from patients, reprogram them using Yamanaka technique to generate iPS cells, and then use your differentiation technique to generate the patient's own cells beating in a dish, okay? Um, and these cells have all the properties of heart cells. We can stain them for heart-specific proteins, one can measure electrical activity from them from a, a technique called patch clamp. You can see the action potential of the heart cells. And one can image calcium in the cells and show that each action potential results in intracellular calcium release leading to contraction. So they have all the properties of heart cells. The next question was to ask, can we get this from the patient that will actually need them? Because we've been generating um, these IPS either from young people or people that are healthy. So to test the ability to test it from the patients with heart failure, we took some skin cells from patients with advanced heart failure that are elderly, have very sick hearts, that have multiple comorbidities, and we were able to get in the same efficiency IPS cells and generate heart cells that are young and healthy, similar to the day that they were born. These heart cells can again couple with rat heart cells. They can be engrafted into the animals and so on. So 
Let's take a moment away for this regenerative medicine project and talk about another potential of using this IPS technology. An attractive uh, application is the potential of using these cells for studying genetic disorders and for drug, disease, drug development. The idea is that if somebody has an inherited disorder, for example, cystic fibrosis, or in the heart, cardiomyopathies, or inherited arrhythmogenic syndrome, one cannot take the patient's heart to study it, right? He needs it. Um, but since the mutation exists in all cells in the body, if you take his blood cells or skin cells, transform them to make iPS cells, and then make heart cells, the hypothesis is that the heart cells would have the same problem as the patient. So to test this, we did a study a few years ago in which we had a patient that had cardiac arrest in the street. Um, she was resuscitated, somebody did CPR, and was brought into our intensive care unit. Um, and we learned at the time that several members uh, uh, of the family died at a young age. She had these storms of polymorphic VT when she was brought. And we noted that she has a prolonged Q interval. So a diagnosis of the long QT syndrome, an inherited arrhythmogenic syndrome that can cause death in otherwise healthy young individuals was made. Um, the family was screened and a mutation was identified in the KCNH2 gene responsible for a potassium channel protein responsible for the long QT type 2. So we took some skin cells from the patient, we reprogrammed them to make IPS, and then we made the patient own heart cells in a dish, and we wanted to see whether the patient cells will have the same abnormality as the patient. The major abnormality in the long QT syndrome is delayed repolarization. Okay, it takes more time for the electrical activity to uh, uh, reset. So we studied the electrical activity of cells first generated from a healthy control individual. So if we take somebody who's healthy, skin cell, make IPS and make heart cells, we can rec record this electrical activity. Interestingly, we can record three types of electrical activity. One that resembles ventricular cells, the lower chamber of the heart. One, one that resembles atrial cells, cells from the upper chamber of the heart, and one that resembles pacemaker or SA nodal cells that are responsible for starting the electrical activity. Now, you don't have to be a cellular electrophysiology to see that in the, our patient, her cells has prolonged action potential duration, the hallmark of this disease. Furthermore, the patient cells also displayed arrhythmias, very similar to the patient. So the patient came with an arrhythmia, we took her cells, we made her own heart cells beating in a dish, and her heart cells developed the same arrhythmias as the patient as she came. So this allows us now to study the mechanism of the disease and also to test drugs. For example, here we tested a drug that opens an alternative potassium channel that compensates for the abnormal channel, and you can see that it shortened the action potential duration and prevented this arrhythmia. I'll skip through this. Um, a second disease in which we are actually now trying to test this, where, whether we can optimize um, the patient-specific therapy is a familial disease called catecholaminergic polymorphic ventricular tachycardia. It has two forms. The, mo the uh, more rare recessive form was actually described for the first time uh, in a Bedouin family for the northern part of Israel by Michael Dar. This family is taken care of by our pediatric cardiologist, um, Asad Khuri and Avram Lorber. And as you can see, these patients develop arrhythmias when they exercise or when they have emotional stress. So these kids, every time they play soccer, they can get an arrhythmia and they can die. We give them drugs. We implant defibrillators that give them a shock to take them out of it. The problem is that the defibrillator shock is very painful. So every time they develop an arrhythmia, they get a shock, they release a lot of adrenaline into the blood, and then they get another arrhythmia and another shock. So sometimes these poor kids come with 30 consecutive shocks and imagine their quality of life. So we wanted to see whether we can use the same technology to understand their disease. So we took cells, 
made iPS cells, made hard cells, and then study the electrophysiological properties, in this case, the calcium transients. And you can see that in contrast to the healthy cells of a healthy individual, these cells from these patients have very, very abnormal calcium, which explains why they are so arrhythmogenic. We then tested a variety of drugs, okay? Many, many drugs, if all FDA approved. Some of them you can see that worsen the effect, but some of them had a very beneficial effect in reducing the arrhythmia. So next we wanted to see whether we can predict the effect of these drugs in the dish on the actual clinical uh, um, results. So for example, this is a drug called flecainide. You can see that in the dish, this is baseline. When you give flecainide, it stopped these arrhythmias. Can it do the same in the patient? So we put the patient on an exercise test, and you can see that he has these arrhythmias at baseline, despite being treated with propanolol beta blockers. When he's pre-treated with flecainide, you can see that these arrhythmias are gone. So there is a nice prediction uh, of the drug effects on the cells to the clinical scenario. So there was a recent study from uh, Michael Arad from Shiba about um, the potential use of half a bouquet by a drug called labetalol in a mouse model of a similar disease. Um, so we wanted to see whether these results in the mouse that was very beneficial, could it help our patient? And as you can see here, in this specific patient, when we gave labetalol, it didn't change. He still had arrhythmias in his cells. So we were now confused. In the mouse, it didn't work. In our human cells, in the mouse, it worked. In our human cells, it didn't work. What will happen in our patient? And you can see that when we test it in our patient, we still has all these arrhythmias. So the patient responded as his cells and not as in the mouse model, um, saying that this gives us another um, uh, res uh, results that um, suggest that this idea of using patients' own cells to, um, for individualized drug therapy could be beneficial. Another technology that I will want to describe is genome editing. This also came from biology. It turns out that bacteria fight viruses that incorporate their DNA by having a specific molecular mechanism, like molecular scissors, that cut out the DNA of the viruses from their genome. So now researchers can take advantage of this mechanism, of this system called CRISPR-Cas, so now you can actually design and modulate, modify the cell's genome. So if somebody has a mutation, you can now cut it out and correct it. So the next uh, generation will be in genetic disorder, it will be trying to use this technology to correct genetic disorder. So we've been using it both to correct the genetic abnormality in our cells, but also to make genetic abnormalities, so we test them. So here, for example, we took cells from a healthy individual together with Stanford and made a mutation similar to our long QT cells, and you can see that we, in the edited line, we can have the same phenotype. So now we have a new tool in which we can modulate very easily the, the, our genes in order to look more carefully on gene function relationship. Okay, so I told you that many of the cells that we put in after transplantation, going back to regenerative medicine, are lost or do not mature. So to this end, we are moving more and more to a tissue engineering approach. The idea is that our organs are not made on only of cells. They are made from cells and a scaffold that gives the shape and supports the cells. So if you take, for example, the liver, take out all the cells, you'll be left with a mesh of protein that provides the scaffold for the organ. So tissue engineering tries to combine cells with polymers to generate tissues or even organs. So here we are collaborating with a German group and also some groups in the Technion to generate engineered tissue. We are mixing our cells, in this case is rat heart cells, together with a collagen. We put it in a mold until it becomes hard, and then we put it on a stretcher device. This is like lifting weights for the cells. After they exercise, they are hypertrophy, like your muscle hypertrophy when you exercise, and they start, uh, the tissue starts to beat spontaneously, as you can see here, and we can get these spontaneously beating rubber band-like structures that can generate a significant amount of force. We then move it to the human embryonic stem cell-derived cardiomyocytes, and as you can see, we can generate this 
calamari-like looking <laughs> beading structures that uh, uh, allows us now to generate a 3D tissue. Um, there are no surgeons here. Um, so if you want to use this tissue engineering, you probably want to uh, transplant this engineered tissue on the heart. This requires a surgeon. Uh, we, are, we like the surgeons, but we are cardiologists, so we want to develop strategies in which we want to transplant this through a minimally invasive procedure. So one strategy that we are trying to develop is a way to deliver a polymer through a catheter as well as the cell directly to the scar and polymerize everything and generate the engineered tissue in the heart. So together with Drawer Selectar, we uh, studied a unique hydrogel made for PEG fibrinogen, which can be injected in a liquid state into the heart, and it then polymerizes to generate this gel. So you can transplant the polymer together with the um, cells into the heart. And here you see the control group in which you just inject cell line with dilatation of the ventricle, a very thin scar. In contrast, when you inject hard cells together with the polymer, you can see that it's at the same timing after infarction, you get a very thick anterior wall with much more cellularity. So again, if we look at the individual heart, in the control group, each heart deteriorates. Interestingly, if you inject just the polymer, it stabilizes the scar, strengthening it, and you can somehow uh, uh, prevent the abnormal remodeling, but the best result is a polymer and cells. Okay. So what about the different heart cell types? I showed you before that we generate different heart cell types during the fritiation. And if you want to transplant cells into the ventricle, you want to transplant the ventricular cells to treat heart failure, not the atrial cells. On the other hand, if you want to generate a model of atrial fibrillation, you want an atrial cell. So our, our collaborator at Toronto, Professor Gordon Keller, is an excellent development biologist, and I just spent a sabbatical with him, and we've been working on trying to generate protocol to generate specific heart cell types. So in his lab, they were able to generate protocols in which you can make only ventricular cells, okay, the lower chamber of the heart, or only atrial cells. Why is it important? I told you, for transplantation to treat heart failure, we want ventricular cells. Why do we want atrial cells? We want atrial cells, for example, to model diseases that affect the atria. And this is just to show you that the electrical activity of the cells are different, so we really can get pure atrial cells or pure ventricular cells. Which arrhythmia aff affects the atrium? It's the most common arrhythmia called atrial fibrillation. It, 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 it increases significantly with age, and it is responsible, for example, for 25% of all cases of stroke. So atrial fibrillation, as you noted in this cartoon, is an, a rhythm in which you have abnormal electrical activity with uh, several reentrant um, circuits going around simultaneously. So can we model atrial fibrillation in a dish? So to this end, we can't use only cells, so we're generating a tissue. Here you can see um, the propagation. We, we, we make like a small atria, and you can see that the uh, propagation of the wave of activation, just by looking through a microscope, you can see that we can generate like a tissue that you can see the wave of contraction in the tissue. Can we make atrial fibrillation? So by pacing rapidly, you can get this, as you can see, this rotor activity, which is what happens, people believe, during atrial fibrillation. So rotor activity is now very big in atrial fibrillation. People think how to eliminate to prevent it. We now can map it using voltage-sensitive dyes. So here, this is how it looks normal conduction. Okay, Using a fast camera, we can identify how conduction works. And this is when we induce the arrhythmia. You can see the tornado-like activity. So now we can study atrial fibrillation and potentially find new ways to cure it. The third type of cells that we've been able to generate together with our uh, Canadian colleagues is SA node-like cells, pacemaker cells. What can you do with them? Perhaps you can do them to replace the need to transplant an electronic pacemaker. Instead of putting an electronic pacemaker to pace the heart when the heart rate is too slow, maybe we can use the patient's own cells to pace the heart. So to test this, we generated either pacemaker cells or ventricular cells, and we wanted to see whether they can pace the heart. So we started with a study in a dish in which we took the SA node cells, the pacemaker cells that we generated, and put them on ventricular tissue. And as you can see, the pacemaker cells started to pace the tissue. 
Okay, you can see that it starts the electrical activity and everything responds. What happens when you put ventricular cells? They are not supposed to be pacemakers, and indeed, the rate is much slower, and they just contract passively, as you would expect from a ventricular cells integrating into tissue. Can it happen in vivo? So we send the cells from Toronto to my lab here in, in the Technion. We injected 2 million SA node cells or ventricular cells into the rat heart. And then two weeks later, we wanted to see whether they can pace the heart. So we can study the heart outside the body. This is the site where we injected our cells here in the apex, and we wanted to see whether they can pace the heart. So if, when we started mapping the electrical activity, we were a bit disappointed. As you can see, the map that is generated, red is early, purple is late. The earliest activation starts here, not where the cells are. And why is this? Because the rat heart beats very fast, about 300 beats per minute. So it's too fast for our human cells to pace. Okay? The, the fastest pacemaker dominates. So we had to slow down the heart rate. So we did uh, something that similar to patients that need um, pacemakers. We slow down the heart rate by slowing the AV node, in this case by giving drugs. This slowed the heart, and now you can see that the electrical activity, as you can see here, starts exactly from where we put the pacemaker cells. So this summarizes it. At baseline, the rat heart is faster, so it, the rat conduction system dominates. But when we slow down the heart rate, similar to a pa patient that needs pacemaker, now the cells become the pacemaker, as you can see here. In contrast, when you put in the ventricular cells, you can see that when we slow down the heart rate, there is nothing. And if something de does develop, it's from the rat conduction system. So this is important for two reasons. One, that maybe in the future we can use these cells as an alternative to electronic pacemaker. And second, that the ventricular cells don't beat spontaneously because they can cause arrhythmias if you give them to heart failure patients. Lastly, we're moving into large animal studies. And one of our collaborators, Mike Laflamme, when he was still in Seattle with Charles Murray, did recently a study in monkeys in which they show that the human cardiomyocytes can regenerate up to 60% of the infarct, and that these cells integrate appropriately into the monkey's heart. So the fact that we can now make billions of cells with affordable cost, our experiments in small and large animals, gives us hope that we can potentially start a, a trial in, in human patients within the next years. Lastly, I want to introduce you the, the mo, uh, uh, in the next few last slides a new technology. This technology is called optogenetics. Again, it was chosen as method of the year by nature. It all started when scientists realized that algae move away or toward light because of the presence of light-sensitive proteins in the algae. A, tit, a prototype protein is called channelrhodopsin, which is a channel that opens following likes exposure and allows cations to go into the cell and change its electrical activity. So scientists then took this idea and delivered this protein into the brain. So now you can control the brain of the animal through um, illumination, through light. You can either induce or suppress brain activity at specific site using light, and this really transformed neuroscience. So we wanted to see whether we can take this technology also to the human, to the, to the heart. And to this end, we, uh, Udi Nusinovich, who is an internal medicine resident here at Rambam, injected uh, the virus encoding for this protein into the heart. So the rat heart started to express the algae protein, which he never saw before. Two weeks later, we took out the heart and we studied it. So you can see that the heart is beating happily uh, outside the body, and within a few seconds, we start to give flashes of blue light. And you can see that each flash of blue light paces the heart. Again, the idea that the blue light interacts with the heart cell that has the algae protein, it opens the channel, generates an electrical activity, and actually converts the cell into a pacemaker cell. Again, you can see that each light generates an action and a beat. Can we do it also when the heart is still in the animal's body? Yes, we can. You can see that uh, the heart is beating happily. Again, we will shine flashes of blue light, and you can see that we can change the heart rate of the, through light. 
What else can we do that? For example, we can resynchronize mechanical activity. In some patients, the ventricle does not contract synchronously. Some area contracts before the other. This deteriorates its function more than, uh, the, uh, than in the, what it would be because of only abnormal contraction. So in the clinic, we now transplant what we call a CRT device, resynchronization therapy device, that paces the heart from two sites. But we are limited to two sites and we're limited to specific locations. But light has no borders, so we can theoretically activate the heart from multiple sites. In this example, we are pacing from three different sites with light, so we deliver the protein into three different sites and we'll activate them simultaneously. First, you look how activity looks during normal rhythm. So this is healthy heart. You can see it's, everything is activated simultaneously, very synchronized. Here we simulate, simulate desynchronization, and you can see that it takes time for the electrical activity to propagate. But when we shine light and activate all three sites simultaneously, you can see that, again, everything is activated simultaneously. So if we summarize this result, sinus rhythm is very good. When we cause the synchrony, it takes a long time to activate the ventricle electrically. It's not good. When we activate it from multiple sites with light, it's very good. So can we do the opposite? Can we stop also electrical activity? Can we make something like a defibrillator, but instead of from electrical activity with light? So I'll finish with that and show you uh, an example uh, from recent weeks. In this case, we created an infarct in a rat. We took the heart out two weeks later. Now we are trying to pace it to generate an arrhythmia, ventricular fibrillation. So now we are pacing. Now you can see the heart develop this ventricular fibrillation. Okay, you can see ventricular fibrillation. And like in the movies, you say clear, you want to give an electrical shock. But here we give a light, and it goes back into normal rhythm. Okay, so with that, I would like to end and thank the people in my lab at the Faculty of Medicine at the Technion, our collaborators here at Rambam and around the world, and thank you for your attention.